So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Mustafa Labsi. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota Medical School and the director of the Duluth Global Health Research Institute. Uh, welcome to the monthly webinar of the Duluth Global Health uh, Research Institute at the University of Minnesota, conducted in partnership with the Africa and Middle East Congress on Addiction. I'm so happy to see many of you here today. Uh, actually, I see many parts of the world uh, are represented in, in the audience. Uh, we do appreciate the, the enthusiasm and support for, for this webinar series and, uh, and hope you find it interesting and relevant to your local and, and regional interests. Uh, we have already lined up an excellent list and, of topics and relevant to, uh, to the multiple themes that, uh, that uh, are of interest to uh, lots of you. Uh, we have uh, upcoming speakers uh, uh, we usually do those at the last Tuesday of each month. So uh, for the next few months, we have a, a few speakers lined up. Still, I'd like you to feel free to send an email or uh, message us uh, with any ideas and suggestions for topics that you would like to be addressed to see addressed here in, in the future uh, future meetings and webinars for today we have uh, selected a topic that is becoming ever more important and and relevant clinically um, and uh, we've invited an excellent speaker a clinician and uh, educator uh, dr robert levy dr levy is a friend of mine and he's a family physician and an addiction medicine doctor. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota. He's also a fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And uh, he practices um, a full spectrum family field, including obstetrics. Um, Dr. Lovey is the president-elect of the Minnesota Society of Addiction Medicine. Uh, and in, nine, in 2018, he was awarded the Minnesota Society of Family Medicine Teacher of the Year Award. So that's a testimony to his uh, acumen in uh, teaching and uh, being an academic medicine educator. Dr. Lavi will present on the emerging evidence and science behind gaming disorder and excessive screen or internet use, as well as uh, treatment options. So before Dr. Lavi starts, uh, let me remind you that you could provide comments and ask questions. You can see in the bottom of your screen a place where you could add comments or ask questions. Uh, we will address these uh, questions at the end of, of the webinar. So for now, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Lavi to give his presentation. Dr. Lavi. Thank you so much, Dr. Lapsi. Um, so hi, I am uh, Robert Levy. I'm as Dr. Mustafa, as Dr. Lapsi gave a introduction to me. I don't have much to add. Um, but I'm here to talk about internet gaming disorder. Um, I wanna start by saying that I've been asked a lot about what the evidence says. And frankly, the evidence whispers at this point. This is an emerging topic, an emerging area, and I wouldn't even call it a disorder yet. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, mostly because uh, it isn't even actually defined as a disorder yet. The DSM does not define it. Uh, this is my conflicts of interest. I'm gonna discuss things that are off label. I don't make any dollars or ruples or anything um, from non-clinical sources. I'm fully employed by the University of Minnesota. Um, so I have no financial conflicts of interest other than not being fired. Uh, this is what I'd like to have, kind of try to get across to you guys, really just three 
points. Uh, if you take away one of these points, I will consider it a win. Um, I, I wrote that per the DSM-5, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that, but it again is not diagnosed. It is not defined in the DSM-5. Uh, but I, I just wanna talk about in general, a little bit about how this can and does compare to other use disorders. Um, what I wanna make very clear, and one of the questions I get asked a lot is, do I have an internet use disorder when I talk about this? Um, and most people do not, right? I do not want to pathologize normal behavior. All of us in 2020 spend a lot of time looking at screens and that isn't a problem. Um, to expect anybody to completely um, abstain from using or looking at a screen in 2020 and 2021 is not a reasonable expectation in the modern world. It isn't. So this falls under, it is an older term that the American Society of Addiction Medicine uses uh, as a process addiction, but things that are uh, not a chemical, but do share similar pathology within the brain and similar, shall we say, behavioral changes that happen when uh, people develop this disorder. So it, it is not necessarily something you can just stop doing like alcohol. Uh, talk about here about the importance of the internet and, and Dr. Alopsi and I were just chatting before the meeting that this is one of the advantages of this format and honestly of 2020 and 2021 is that we have participants from all around the world watching this and I am in my office at my home in Minneapolis giving this talk, and there's no way I could do this without the internet uh, to reach all of you fine people. Time-based definitions this is important too. Time-based definitions of internet use are actually not helpful. It is a little bit like the amount of alcohol someone drinks is not helpful to diagnose them with alcohol use disorder, so is the time that someone spends looking at the internet. Uh, again, much like caffeine, the amount of caffeine you drink or, you know, caffeine use in general can be quite normal and people can consume a lot of caffeine and not cause problems. But in this situation, what happens when you cause problems? I mean, this is modern life, right? It's just how things are. I, I have had dreams about doing work online. It is a thing. So what I want to start with is what do you what do you picture when you look at a gamer? Right? It's typically someone younger and someone who's who's very technologically savvy and uh, somebody who spends a lot of time playing games. Often, typically male. I, I didn't include that data in uh, this talk, but there is a lot of frankly sexism in the industry as well and I could talk about that but I, I in general people think of men but that's not true um, these are pictures of friends of well one is a friend of mine and one is family members um, th this is a friend of mine uh, he is a professional volleyball player and when he is not playing volleyball he is playing video games and can spend up to 18 hours a day playing video games he plays a lot of video games on the right is my aunt, and she also has played every Final Fantasy game from the beginning, from the very beginning until up to now, and has played probably tens of thousands of hours of Final Fantasy. So this can expand all ages, all sexes, all races, all creeds, much like all other use disorders. A little bit here, we'll talk a little bit about um, the difference in sex and age, but identifying themselves as gamers, again, is mostly men, but however, if you actually look at who plays video games, it's basically even, um, though it does skew a little bit older for women. There's a picture of me playing a video game at work, which I am. Admit, I do do that occasionally when it's slow and I have time to kill. This was when I was on call and I was waiting for a baby to be delivered, I decided to go to my office and play a little bit. It was also in the middle of winter, as you can see, because that's my winter coat. This is important. Internet use disorder, because it doesn't have a solid foundation of what the actual definition is, I kind of revert back to the original definition of alcohol use disorder. 
um, by Father Martin, which was, if alcohol causes problems, it is a problem. So when the internet and games and screens cause problems, then it is a problem. And, and, and what I mean by cause problems is problems with relationships, works, work, or mental and physical health. Again, some of this is in the eye of the beholder. Parents in general don't like it when kids play six hours of gaming, but they are psyched when kids are at school, right? Doing learning. Uh, what's the difference? We can talk a little bit about that, but frankly, not much. This is a huge problem. Most of the data I have is from the United States or Japan. Uh, and so it is skewed that way. Again, there's a, a paucity of data on this. Um, but as I mentioned, the average female, the average gamer who is female uh, typically skews a little bit older or men skew a little bit younger, but the average age is much older than most people realize. And 160 million Americans play internet-based games. That's a lot. It's more than half. That's a lot of, this is a very busy slide. This is a lot of um, data that I'm just throwing at you, but Essentially, what I want you to get away from this is a lot of people think that the internet and screens are problematic for their kids. And parents in general think that screen time makes it harder for them to parent and that they have to compete with the screen. What do experts say? Well, not much. Um, as much as I like to consider myself an expert, I actually deleted this part, um, but I had a slide saying that I, my expertise in gaming is mostly that I play video games quite a bit, and I do, I, I enjoy video games. Uh, it's hard to include myself or anybody as an expert in this field because there is such so little that is understood. Uh, the DSM does not, as I mentioned, does not include internet addiction or any sort of screen use disorder or anything like that. Um, the only formally recognized process or behavioral addiction is gambling. Um, however, internet gaming is under a review for the DSM-6. And uh, WHO and the ICD-11 are including this. But as, it, as of right now, the ICD-10 does not include any codes for internet use disorder, which actually makes treatment quite difficult. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, that's why I said put treatment in quotes there because without a definition and without a diagnosis, it's hard to define what treatment is. But um, Japan South, and, and South Korea and China are leading the way in treatment. Um, but there is not a strong understanding of what's going on. They are kind of like the early days of alcohol use disorder, just trying a bunch of different behavioral techniques to try to help people that struggle with this. So, what I did in this slide, and this is mostly for you to review, is I took the definition of alcohol use disorder that the DSM-5 has and tried to squeeze it into what it would look like if the DSM-6 or similar defines internet use disorder or gaming disorder as an actual disorder. Um, the important things to look at here are preoccupation with gaming. So I do game a lot, I do. But when I go to work, I think about work. I don't really think about games. I don't have this preoccupation with gaming. And I'm not trying to uh, deny my problem. I actually don't think I have a problem, which I guess anybody who had a problem would think that. Uh, continuing to game despite problems is very important here. And giving up other activities or loss of interest in uh, previous activities, right? It's hard to say that there's an actual withdrawal sy symptom, though people can get sad or anxious or irritable Process addictions in general, process use disorders are hard to define that way as is tolerance. There isn't a really good definition of what tolerance means. Um, but basically the negative consequences of your use. American Association of Pediatrics has recommendations regarding screen time in general. And I summarize that here, which basically children should use screens very little. It's not particularly helpful for um, ch child development. The human brain does perceive things differently in two dimensions as three dimensions, which is very, it has a lot of emerging evidence on this. And this is particularly noteworthy for um, online psychotherapy, which, it, or 
therapy in general, which can which is very effective, but it is processed differently in the brain, and we're just learning more about that now. Um, children six and up, though, you should have consistent limits on time spent using media, and by that I mean digital media, and, and I'll talk more about that later in the, in the lecture. Um, I don't know how many of you know what Fortnite is. Fortnite is one of the largest uh, games currently in the, in the world. Um, this is data out of May of 2020. As you see, there are 350 million Fortnite users. That means that everybody in the United States would be a Fortnite user. Since I don't play, I imagine people internationally do. Uh, that's quite a lot of people. And it has grown, as you can see here, incredibly quickly. Um, just last year, from March of 2019 to May of 2020, 100 million new users joined Fortnite. So people are using this, even if we're not, or I'm not. This slide here is to illustrate, to start to illustrate why this is going to become, and it will become a larger problem as we progress. And that is, there is a tremendous amount of money in this industry. Uh, I can't stress that enough. My uh, nephew, who just graduated from college as a, um, with a, computer science degree, took a job working for EA Sports, which is a very large uh, gaming company or a company that makes video games. And he makes more money straight out of college than I do as a doctor, having practiced for over 10 years at the university. And that's his first year out of college. There's a lot of money in these games and they need people to program them. So it pays very well. Uh, but where do they get this money from? Well, they get it from users. And how do they get money from users? Well, they get it by making them wanna play the game. And how do you make people want to play the game? Well, you make it slightly addicting. That is kind of the way that the world works. Uh, we talk about just if you if you guys are looking at this data, what I find particularly interesting here is forty percent of revenue from all online games came from two percent of players who spent a thousand dollars or more in a calendar year. It's an incredible amount of money on a game. Ninety percent came from those who spent a hundred dollars or more. And top players can spend, I mean, th this number is actually even a little old. Last I looked right before this lecture that people have spent now tens of thousands of dollars on Fortnite and other games. Um, and players, and, and so they start to do these games, understand this, and they start to do things within the game to make it more likely that you will spend money. And one of the things they've done is they found that if you're part of a team, you are more likely to spend money to help your character get better to help the team. And you're more likely to spend to be on playing the game if your teammates are on playing the game. And so they use this kind of almost peer pressure model to get you to spend money and to get you to spend time on screen. So eight and a half times more likely to monetize than players who do not or belong to a guild or a group of players. And this creates a whole other realm, right? So then if you start getting into competitive gaming and things like that, uh, it creates a whole other market. One of the interesting things that's happened is esports. Um, when 2020 and COVID-19 first hit, ESPN actually had to stop. ESPN is a channel in the United States that, that um, shows basically live sporting events. Um, when we shut everything down for COVID, they couldn't show that anymore, so they showed esports. Esports is literally people playing games of sports, such as video games like Madden, which is a American football online game, or FIFA, which is a international football game, or hockey games, or soccer games, or, or um, basketball games, things like that in general. And people are professional sports players. The industry made $1.1 billion in 2019, which is the last time they have data. Discord, which is a uh, platform much like Zoom, but basically where players from these guilds or teams can come together and discuss and talk about things. There's over 300 million registered users. I am one of them. I do use it for some of my games. Twitch, which is a online platform much like YouTube, but it's only live streaming and basically used almost solely for watching other people play video games, um, is monetized over a billion dollars now. And the number one streamer in the world is this uh, gentleman here, PewDiePie. That's a picture of him. He has 100 million followers and has over $20 million from streaming. The issue, as I don't know if these people 
if people on this webinar know, is these people can hold a tremendous sway over younger people. And they are not really vetted by anybody. PewDiePie had, um, had a big, big issue about anti-Semitism. He made several anti-Semitic comments and, and spoke very well of the Nazi regime on his streaming channel. And this wasn't caught for several months before he essentially was demonetized. However, he still has a huge sway online and he still is the number one streamer on Twitch. I just want to define the playing ground a little bit when we talk about this. If, you, if you're going to do any work in this field, you need to know these terms. Um, and I'm actually going to start at the bottom, which is the most common type of game, which is a real-time strategy game. That is essentially a game where you are playing against either the artificial intelligence or human, and you are taking, you're playing in real time. So the faster you can click things, the better you can do and the uh, more likely are to win. Sports games that I talked about, first person shooters are kind of the classic, I am a person with a gun going around and murdering aliens or whatever you're killing. Um, MMORPGs are one of the fastest growing games. They are massively multiplayer online role-playing games such as World of Warcraft, and I'll talk about that. And then the most popular game is a free to play game, pay to win game. And those are games that are typically on phones or pads. Uh, you can download them for free, you can play for free, but they have all these mechanisms in place that really hinder you unless you buy premium currency. And then you can actually beat other players. This is an actual quote by me from 2014 when I uh, stopped playing World of Warcraft. I actually didn't stop playing for any particular reason other than um, my friends stopped playing and I was like, all right, we're done. But I used to call it the crack cocaine of video games. Um, League of Legends has become the largest MMORPG now, but uh, World of Warcraft was. And I had a group of 10 people that would always play at the same time. And this, my background is actually from World of Warcraft. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And I spent a lot of time playing that game. Video games don't always have negative effects. There is a FDA approved video game for the treatment of ADHD. And I think we'll see this more and more. It's called Endeavor RX. Um, I have actually never played it, but apparently it can be used with ADHD or actually autism use disorder or autism spectrum disorders. So let's take a step back and talk about the bigger picture. I know I'm talking quickly. There's just a lot of things I wanna get through and I wanna make sure I have enough time. Let's talk about the, the structural issues of the internet. There are, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of money in this, and there's a lot of thought and purpose from people that have a lot of money into how to get the most amount of money. And this is how video games start becoming, or actually screen time in general, starts becoming addictive. And that is that we have known for a long time that if you get a reward or a dopamine hit, which I could explain in, in briefly is the area of the part of the brain that has pleasure is fueled by dopamine. If you spike in that area, you are essentially telling the rest of your brain that that is good and that you should do that more. Eating gives us a dopamine hit. Uh, when we're cold, finding someplace warm. When we're thirsty, drinking gives us dopamine. It's those, uh, trying to be reinforcing for survival. Sex also gives dopamine hits or orgasm in particular. Uh, but use disorders corrupt that system and give you hits for, or make you think that, say, alcohol is the same as food, and so that you need to have alcohol to survive, or that alcohol is important for your survival, like food or water. Um, and, and games understand this, and they want to tap into that. Can you imagine how much money and how much time we would spend playing video games if we thought that we needed to do it to survive? Um, and so video game companies are not, not stupid and they, they target this in particular. So they don't talk about use disorders or things like that. They talk about eyeball time and it's not just games, but screen time in general. So YouTube and websites and Twitch and um, streaming services such as Netflix all talk about eyeball time as something that they're looking after. And so this starts to look like something that it actually is designed to be addicting. One of the other things too about the internet is it's anonymous. And that has a lot of power in the human mind as well. 
and can be quite reinforcing. In particular, when, this is just an illustration of uh, kind of the human condition these days, but in, in particular, when you are feeling stress and pain in your own life, it can be an escape. Um, and this is talked a lot about in this book by Dr. Eyal about hooked. It's basically how to engineer things to become addicting. And it talks about, I'm just gonna go through this really quickly. It talks about triggers to get people to, uh, to change their behavior, basically to start playing video games. So stress, and then external or notifications, things that make you want to continue to play the games. And then having a variable reward, this is very important. If, I don't know how many of you know um, reinforcement, but intermittent reward is much more reinforcing than consistent reward, right? It's behavioral 101. And so these games are designed to give you intermittent rewards. World of Warcraft, by the way, does this very, very well. Initially, it gives you quite a frequent rewards, and then they become much harder to obtain and much more intermittent. You can do the same thing over and over again and get very few or no rewards and then suddenly get this huge reward. And it is incredibly motivating to get you to continue playing. And it gets you invested, right? The more that you play these games, the more that you want to continue to play these games. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about now about this trigger action loop that is designed. So, Again, Fortnite is here, but I want to talk about Netflix here. And this is the hook model. And actually, Netflix uses this terminology in their own internal communications. But you get this external trigger that I'm bored or I'm stressed from a long day at work. And so you go ahead and you open Netflix and you start searching for something that is pleasurable for you. And I don't know about you guys, I have a Netflix account. There's a lot of stuff that I don't like. So I look through stuff and I watch stuff and I'm like, meh. Meh. And then I hit upon a uh, uh, show that I really like. And that is the reward. Then you get the investment. You kind of typically watch the whole thing. It also helps you because as autoplay, it'll just keep playing episodes unless you stop it. Um, and eventually you will be satisfied and you will have fixed your boredom. But eventually, of course, it comes back again and you will get bored and do this action again and again and again. And it becomes this loop of people becoming invested in Netflix. Fortnite is the same thing, but Fortnite also has uh, a mechanism internally to buy items. So get notifications from friends or requests to join. You get seeking connection from boredom or loneliness, especially prevalent in 2021 these days. Start playing the game, you start getting rewards and having more and more investment, which starts to make you want to buy things and spend more time and money and getting more invested in the game, which gets you more involved in the game, kind of cycling forward. Uh, I'm thinking if I have time of this. Basically, there are very advanced artificial intelligence algorithms that are constantly working behind the scenes in, not necessarily in games though, often in games, but also in things like Netflix, Google, Amazon, um, your phone, all sorts of things that uh, specifically are targeting things for you to get you to spend as much time as you can on your phone or on YouTube or on Google. And one of the really important things that I think that uh, comes across on this is that it is incredibly individualized for the person. Um, and the model knows, right, once you click, you're sending information back to the artificial intelligence to give it more information. And we give these artificial intelligence a tremendous amount of information on a daily basis. Our searches, what applications we use, who we talk to, who we text, all of this stuff. This also happens with political filters, a huge issue in the United States these days. What I find very interesting is, um, this is an experiment I have done with a friend of mine who actually I, I should give credit to Dr. Emily Brunner is an addiction medicine doctor for, um, for Sage Prairie. She also works for M Health and, and Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. Um, and she has actually done a lot of work with me on this and has done many of these slides or her slides. Um, when she searches, search, uh, searches for panthers, she will get pictures of cats because she loves cats and has a cat and does all things cats. If I search for panther online or panthers, I get images of the American football 
football team, the Panthers, because I search more for sports. I don't get any images of, I don't get any images of cats. Not an image or way down in the search because I don't like cats because I'm highly allergic. And if I get around one, they kill me. Well, they are cute. Of all the organizations, Facebook does this the best. Uh, Facebook got into a lot of trouble in 2016 in the United States for, for experimenting on their users. They found that if you show negative news feeds, people are much more likely to spend much longer on Facebook. And they published the data and they got into a huge amount of trouble from the United States. And so what did they do? Well, they didn't stop researching on people and experimenting on their users. They just stopped telling us what they find, but they still absolutely collect all of your data. And it creates this bubble, which becomes more isolated. We are all living in our own individual bubble not just for Google search things, but for news feeds, games, uh, weather, I mean, anything. It becomes highly individualized and it becomes more and more lonely and more and more disconnected, which leads us to spend more and more time on the dev very device that is disconnecting us. And again, I'm not here trying to preach negativity. There are tremendous positivities to this. But if we're not aware of this tendency, then th there is nothing we can do to prevent some of the, shall we say, darker aspects. There's very clear data. It's going as far back as 2010 about the more that you use social media, the higher the prevalence and incidence of depressive disorders. Um, there's this thing called fear of missing out or FOMO. People always show their best lives on Facebook or Twitter or any other social media, um, and it's not reality. But when you are looking from the outside in, you perceive it as reality. Uh, Dr. Brunner has a great picture of her family at Disney World, all smiling and all holding uh, a Mickey thing, and they look like the perfect family. And um, she tells a story like the lead up to that picture was brutal. Her kid, one of her kids was sick. One of her kids was having a tantrum. tantrum. Her husband hated she and her husband had had a big fight and they weren't talking to each other. Like this is right before the picture, but that picture, they look like the perfect family that never has an issue, right? But clearly they're like, like every other family, they have all sorts of issues. Um, and, and this leads to the problem. Smartphones only make this um, more intense. All right, so there are all sorts of various subheadings on the internet. I'm not even gonna go into this. Um, but internet shopping is a big issue these days, social media use. These are actually separate or considered separately in um, internet use or screen use disorder. Pornography is a big one. 4% of the web pages contain pornography, which is actually down quite a bit from the late 90s. However, up to 15% of internet searches are still for pornography. So a lot of pornography, which leads to the uh, famous song on the musical Avenue Q, The Internet is for Porn. This is an actual Broadway musical. Online gaming is another huge issue, though in the United States, it's mostly illegal, um, but internationally, it is still vastly unregulated and a, and a, and a growing problem. This is what playing looks like these days. Another aspect, again, kind of on the doom and gloom, and I promise I will get to treatment. I promise I will get to a, a more positive view. Um, but the, the brain is a use dependent org organ, much like um, other mus uh, basically muscles or other complex organs in the body, right? Like the heart, things like that. Um, and the more you use it, the more it will grow. And the way that you use it is the way that it will grow. And being socialized in th with three dimensional other humans is important for development. And 2020 and 2021 have already taken that from us. And on top of that, before that, we were spending a lot of time online. And it changes the human brain in ways that we don't understand. So that's an area for research. Uh, it might not be negative, but it will be different. There is a very, very tight link between internet use, especially gaming, but all screen use and obesity. For every one hour played to video games is a twofold increase in obesity. This is in very large aggregate data, mostly again in the United States, which has its own obesity problem. 
Uh, the interesting thing is something called exergaming. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but there are certain systems that actually make you move when you play video games. The Nintendo Wii is one of them. I remember playing this game, this system, when I was in residency or training. Uh, and to play tennis, you really had to like play tennis. You had to like move around and stuff like that. And there actually is not a link between exergaming and obesity. Um, and sad to say, I would actually get out of breath playing the stupid game. It's first for me. Insomnia, look, as, as a primary care physician, which is still my, my main practice, the number of people struggling with insomnia in the last five years has really skyrocketed. And these people almost always, when they come to me, are using their phone right before they go to sleep. And I could give a whole lecture on that. But essentially, it activates part of the brain that makes you think it's time to wake up. It activates the amygdala, which is an area that deals with stress and can cause all sorts of hormonal changes is not healthy for you to use your phone before you go to bed. Says the guy who almost always uses his phone before he goes to bed. It's hard. All right, so what interventions help other than going to a lake, one of the lakes in Minnesota? It's a very classic lake in Minnesota. It is very shallow and has a lot of rocks and weeds in the bottom. No one is talking about prohibition. We can't. The vast majority of people who use the internet use it for appropriate reasons. And I just talked about the harms that happen, but actually in general, the studies all say that the benefit of online stuff far outweighs the harms, unless you have excessive use, which they don't define. These studies do not define that. But again, comparing to alcohol, the vast majority of people can drink healthily and normally only a very small proportion of people, not very small, but a small proportion of people develop alcohol use disorder. The same would be said for um, screen use or internet use. At some point, people that develop alcohol use disorder develop problems with their life related to alcohol, same with the internet. And again, most of us, and I like to think um, most children and adolescents use this without harm. So what is the gold standard for diagnosis? Well, it's an individual assessment from a physician who can, a, can identify a use disorder and comorbid problems. And I've listed the, the most common comorbid problems that happen. Uh, this is expensive, time consuming, and not reasonable to offer to everyone. Uh, so we need to do other things other than that. Now, I guess I, I said physician here, but it doesn't have to be physician. It can be any sort of provider, uh, behavioral health or other who can, who is trained in identifying these things. It does not need to be a physician. I should change that word. So this is, this is actually based on this study, um, what the evidence was around treatment. And it, it, the, the studies mostly focus around pharmacotherapy. Uh, in general, um, most pharmacotherapy is not effective. Basically, bupropion or Wellbutrin in the United States showed some promise, but it kind of petered out more long term. There's interestingly, there's never been a study or a long term study on naltrexone or Revia, which is the established treatment for uh, gambling disorder, which is the only other process disorder currently recognized. Uh, CBT, which is, at least in the United States, the gold standard for treatment of mood disorders, has shown very mixed evidence for any sort of treatment. Um, but in general, all these studies, all 22 of them, have a huge weakness in that they are not standardized. There is a non-random assignment of patients, and there are basically, at least in my review and in, in uh, Zajac, I can't pronounce that, but in, his, in their review, um, they, they determine that the control groups are not appropriate. So that's an important thing. So what does the evidence show? Well, it shows that especially for most of the evidence is around teens. And for teens, one of the best things that we can do is modeling behavior, meaning we ourselves should put our phones down and spend more time with them. That has actually, that just itself has the best outcomes for decreasing the incidence of, or the prevalence of a internet or screen use disorder. Uh, 
So as I create this, I, and this is actually a slide from Dr. Brunner, I don't have kids, but um, when she created this, she's in a rural cabin on her screen uh, with her kids begging for attention outside roasted marshmallows. So it's hard to do, I get that, and we all get that. Um, and a great movie to, to learn more about this is a movie called Screenagers. We always have our phones, always. Um, and it can be frustrating. I, when I come home from work, my wife is typically home before me and will be um, on her phone and kind of like, hey, and I'm like, hey, I'm home, come on, let's talk. And she's like, yeah, whatever. Like, I mean, not really, but uh, you know, it, 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 it says something. Anyway, I know we're running out of time. I, I do wanna give a shout out to Pause and Reset, which is a book by uh, Dr. Petrie that talks a lot about treating people with um, uh, kind of creating a framework for treating adolescents with um, internet or uh, video game use disorder. Uh, what is very important is to uh, not punish them for using it, and that is to find alternative behaviors. And these are the three steps that she says. One is to record how much gaming they're actually doing and record how much time they're doing it. Try to negotiate with them uh, healthy alternative recreational activities and then positively enforce these alternatives that happen and to not punish relapses. So it's very important to have non-aggressive, non-judgmental communication with all forms of use disorders, not just internet gaming use disorder. Um, remember, there is a reason that we are so involved in this and that is life is hard, especially now. And, and when you're living in, this, in the real world, it can be hard, but when you're playing a video game, you're whoever you want to be. When I was at the height of my World of Warcraft playing, um, I was among the top players in the in our realm in the United States, and uh, I would walk around, and other characters would literally bow to me. And you can imagine how reinforcing that is. I mean, but I spent probably back in my twenties thousands of hours playing that game to get colored pixels, which actually don't really mean anything, but they create a world where it does mean something. So it is. It is important to remember that when you're talking to your kids and, and get them to see something and get them to, or adolescents, to get them to do something that they feel respected to do also. Anyway, I know we're running out of time and I very much want to get to questions. So I am going to end here, but I just wanna make sure that gaming, that you understand that the screen use, while very important, is not a constitutional right and is important to set limits on that. But essentially the treatment, that I want to outline are those three steps, which is to record the problem, find healthy alternatives, positive reinforcement for the healthy alternatives. It has the best evidence for treatment. Okay, that's what I got. I mean. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Uh, there are a few questions and some good comments too. Uh, I encourage you all to uh, type your question in the question and answer uh, window, but the questions that came through in the through the comment uh, window, I have one question here. Uh, and that is, do companies design games uh, to be addictive? I think you touched on that a little bit. Do you would you like to elaborate a little bit? Yeah. So the the short answer is no. They don't design them in particular to be addictive. They design them to maximize eyeball time or to maximize the amount of time you will play the game. Uh, it just happens that the two coincide. In order to maximize the amount of eyeball time, you make them addicting. So yes, but not directly. And related to that, um, is there or are there efforts to try to regulate that, that tendencies to maximize, as you say, the the engagement or what have you. Just to... I, I, I don't know that in the international world. I will say in the United States, no, no. That's how these companies make the most amount of money. And um, we allow them to pursue as much money as they can. There is no regulation on that currently. So here's another question. Uh, can using 
the internet be a simple hobby or a way to pass time without it being addictive? Absolutely. The vast majority of people yeah. use the internet as a way to pass time. And I would say um, that even my thousands of hours of World of Warcraft still were a way to pass time. I mean, I did that over a decade. It never interfered with my life. I became a physician. I became successful. I became chief resident. I, you know, I mean, all these things. Thank you. Uh, there is a question here. Uh, in your opinion, do you expect to see this in the DSM-6? <laughs> I don't know. I was really expecting to see more um, process or uh, behavioral addictions in the DSM-5. And uh, we only got gambling. I, I really thought in particular um, disordered eating would be in the DSM-5 and it is not. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't make predictions for what the field of psychiatry will do. Thank you. And there's another question. What about the screen use and uh, risk for suicidal, suicidality or suicide behavior or engagement in suicidal thoughts? I am not aware of a direct link. The only link I know of, and again, I, I am not saying that I know all the data. The only data that I know of is the increased link between excessive screen use and major depressive disorder. And of course, there is another link between major depressive disorder and suicidal ideation. So you would think, you know, transitively, yes, but I don't think, you know, because A leads to B and B leads to C, A leads to C. I don't know if there's a direct study that shows that A leads to C, so to speak. Excellent point. Yeah, yeah. So here's another question too. And any comments on the legitimacy of connecting violence with gaming? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, as far as I'm aware, no. There's not a link between gaming and violence and, and like physical violence. Um, the United States has a, a almost a, its own pandemic with mass shootings. Um, but there has never been shown a link between screen use disorder and that yet that I am aware of again. So, yeah, not really, which people often don't understand that. They think there is, but there is not. Yeah, and here's another point I think that it was understood already, but it's worth repeating, and that is gaming behavior. So it's not a disease, right? Right, right as long as it's done in a controlled, moderate fashion, it can be construed or be seen as a hobby. It has to cause problems with your life for it to be a problem, essentially. And not like, oh, I went to bed late a couple of times because I was playing a video game. Like I didn't go to work because I was up all night playing a video game type thing. <laughs> uh, other question. Yeah. I guess our audience is sensitive to this issue that you highlighted earlier uh, about pathologizing uh, this. So here's a question about, is it more or less addictive than caffeine use? Oh, so um, <laughs> caffeine, I could go and I give a whole talk about caffeine, says the guy, I just finished my cup of coffee. Um, caffeine use disorder is not a recognized use disorder. Um, for a variety of reasons, but there actually isn't such a thing as caffeine use disorder. Caffeine is not considered addicting. Um, that's actually one of my favorite talks. <laughs> uh, it's fascinating, the, the science behind that. But the, the, the short, short version is um, humans are the only animal, the only primate that will self-administer caffeine. No other primate will self-administer caffeine. No other animal, no other vertebrate will self-administer caffeine. It's considered a poison. Yeah. Um, I've seen uh, multiple comments and questions here about uh, patterns of gaming and engagement with the screen and internet during the pandemic. Has there been any research to track escalation of this, uh, of engaging in gaming? And oh, I, I am aware of all sorts of stuff being done, but no outcome data yet. Uh, I... I can't imagine it's been good, but that's speculation, purely speculative. I can speak for the incidence of chemical overdose, in particular opioid overdose. That number has skyrocketed during the pandemic worldwide, as has um, alcohol use disorder. I mean, it is markedly worse 
in 2021 after a whole year of the uh, COVID pandemic, even in countries that weren't heavily affected. Uh, well, I see more comments, more questions here. Uh, I think uh, we've, there are some other questions and comments, but I think we've covered them in the answers. That we I, I do, there was one, sorry, Dr. Alpsi, there was one that I did want to discuss and someone was talking about loot boxes and I didn't get into that. I actually had a whole bunch of slides on it, but I needed to cut some for time. Uh, there's this phenomenon too, where you like buy a premium currency and then you essentially gamble to get a reinforcement in the game. And there is all sorts of legislation around eliminating that as almost like a form of online gambling, at least in the United States. And uh, Fortnite had a huge issue with the loot llama, that's what they called it, um, around that. And actually they had a class action lawsuit and lost and had to refund people hundreds of millions of dollars. That being said, they refunded it in in-game currency. So you had to pay, you didn't get actual cash, you got the in-game premium currency. So you had to spend it on something else. But yes, that is something that's happening. Excellent. Thank you for the information and thank you all for attending. And uh, if you have any additional questions and comments about this or other uh, uh, webinars, please feel free to reach out to uh, to me personally, to or to any one of us in, uh, within the DGHRI. And I'll spend a little bit of time trying to answer some of the online Q and A's also. Um, yeah, I see uh, uh, another colleague actually commenting on, uh, asking whether you have any comments on ICD-11 guidelines. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, because I don't know the ICD-11 guidelines, because I am in the United States, and we are a decade behind everybody, and ICD-10 is still this new thing to us, so to my great shame, no. Uh, have you come across some qualitative studies that looked into the gamers' motivations and why they are playing games? Sorry. I... Yes, um, the vast majority of people play games due to feeling lonely, isolated, or bored, or to let off steam. And you mentioned stress at some point. Stress, yeah. I mean, but those are all forms of stress. But yes, in general, sorry, I should put it in your parlance, of course, you should have known. But yes, stress. Stress is the main trigger. Okay. All types of stress. Perfect. All right. Uh, well, thank you all and uh, appreciate your uh, engagement with this uh, webinar and the questions and the comments and uh, look forward to reconnecting uh, next month. Uh, and thank you so much, Dr. Levy, for uh, stimulating and engaging uh, presentation and uh, uh, look forward to future communication on this and other topics. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.